today we are kind of concluding this journey. It's, it's always a bittersweet for me whenever we end the series that I've really enjoyed and felt God work in my own heart. And it's, it's sweet because there's like a completion. You finished a part of the Bible and you better understand it and you've seen God at work. And so there's this sweet, but there's also kind of like, oh, like it's already over. You're like, no, I'm glad it's already over. Wherever you're at on that continuum, today we finish our series in Revelation 1, 2, and 3. You know, God, God does something whenever, whenever I have this privilege of studying the Bible and then asking the Spirit to apply it to me long before I apply it to anyone Else And I have found these last couple of months just having this, this vision of Revelation chapter 1, Jesus, has been impressed on my mind and on my soul in ways that has never happened before. Just reading it afresh and falling in love with Jesus all over again and seeing his stunning radiance. And it's become part of even Bonnie and my conversation on, are you trusting Revelation 1, Jesus? And sometimes I'm like, Oh, woman, you're right. Like, that's happened multiple times in the last couple of months. And it's like, the Spirit also reminding me, are you trusting in Jesus as he is clearly revealed in Revelation chapter 1? Or are you trusting in another version of Jesus that you have manufactured for yourself in your own mind? Are you trusting in worshiping in loving burning hot for the real Jesus as he's revealed in the inspired word of God. And we need a big vision of Jesus. And that's what you see in Revelation. He is stunningly radiant. And if you haven't read Revelation 1, I encourage you to read it afresh. And there's a similar parallel in Hebrews chapter 1. It's also high Christology. Christology is study of Christ, study of Jesus. And so there are texts like John chapter 1 that describes him as the word of God. That's high Christology. And then you also have it here in Revelation chapter 1. You also have it in Hebrews chapter 1. These are all Christological, if you want to use big words, texts. They describe what Jesus is like. And Hebrews 1 verse 3 says that Jesus is the radiance. So I didn't make these words up. They're in the Bible. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. That's Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. Again, (laughs) hi. Christology is describing who Jesus is, and it is stunning. He is radiant, and he reflects the glory of God because he is one with the Father. He is God in the flesh. And we'll begin to look at that in a couple of weeks. And here in December, we'll be looking at the significance and how stunning it is that God the Son became a human. And that's what we celebrate at Christmas time, our calling as a church is to reflect that radiance of God. So may renewal be radiant. That's my heart's desire. And I pray that's yours as well, that this church would truly be radiant. We've been meditating on these seven letters. Some did well, some were not doing so well at reflecting, radiating the glory of God. And I'll pull up a map here that we've looked at a few times in this series. This map is of modern-day Turkey, of ancient, it was known as Asia Minor. These were seven actual historical churches that really existed, and their ruins are still there to this day. And so we saw in week one that down in the left corner, Patmos, that is where the apostle John was, he had been persecuted and suffered and beaten, and according to historical accounts, even he was submerged in boiling oil, but he somehow survived that and was disfigured but survived, and then he was exiled to Patmos, where he lived out his days, and according to history, he was eventually released 
towards the very end of his life and went back to his home church of Ephesus. So this is what we read through church history. But he was doing hard labor, suffering in Patmos, and he wrote the the book of Revelation that Jesus inspired and gave to him and addressed it to seven churches in these seven cities. And these are on a major road, on think of it as the mail route. So these seven churches received an actual letter in the mail. Now, they probably didn't have on their cell phone where it says packages received and there's a picture and all this evidence that they dropped it off. Like, they didn't have Amazon Prime. But, same principle, they were using what they had available to them, which was the mail. And so a courier took it to these seven churches, all in sequence. And so if you look at Revelation 2 and 3, it follows these seven churches in sequence as they would have received them in the mail. So the last one, Laodicea, we'll be looking at that church here this morning as we wrap up the series. Now, I want to show you another graphic that shows how these seven letters that Jesus wrote to these seven churches have symmetry. Now, there is actual structure to these seven churches. Now, if you remember back to whenever you were in school and you were learning about poetry and a chiasm or a a chiastic structure, you're like, what are you talking about? You can Google it later. It's a thing, all right? And so you have A, B, and then C, one, two, three, and then back to B, and then A. So it's like an X. And so, and so what you have is structure with these seven letters. You have the first one, Ephesus. The message was that they had lost their first love. And that book ends because the last one that we'll look at today, also they had lost their first love. And then you have Smyrna. That was faithful. Now, they were being persecuted and suffering, but they were faithful. And we saw that last week with Philadelphia, the seated brotherly love, where they also were faithful and not called out for anything, just encouraged to continue to be faithful. And those three churches in the middle. So, again, A, B, C, and then B, A again. These three in the middle. You have Pergamum, and here's a continuum. They were compromised. So this is the compromised church. They allowed false teaching. And whenever you, whenever you compromise the Bible, when you compromise the authoritative, inspired word of God, then all of a sudden you begin to disintegrate and then you become immoral. And you now adopt a worldly, ungodly lifestyle. You begin to think like the world, and then what the world says is okay, we then say, oh, it's okay. And the reason why we even think it's okay is because we have compromised the Bible. And we're not relying on the authoritative, inspired, inerrant word of God. So the compromised church leads to the immoral church, and that leads to Sardis, the dead church. So I mentioned this to you not just to talk about a chiastic structure. Like, that's not... Why? It's not about poetry. It's not about the structure. It's, I mentioned it for two reasons. One, I want you to see that Jesus is amazing. I want you to see how the Bible fits together and how there is structure and order and a sense of purpose to everything that God does. And the Bible from Genesis to Revelation completely fits together and tells the one story of God, the story of a Redeemer who through his work on the cross offers us forgiveness. And it's one story. Like we saw last summer, it is a tapestry that it all fits together. And you even see that with these seven letters. But beyond seeing how it all fits together in God's sovereign purposes, we also see that Jesus wants his churches to flourish. He wants churches to be faithful. And there's a continuum here. Like, it's fluid. It's not as though a church is unfaithful and then it's stuck there. Because remember, in these letters, the call is to repent, to return constantly. And so a church can be in flux and there's always movement. And so may we be a church that does never compromise. 
and that does not adopt immoral lifestyle as normal. May we not be a church that dies. Then may we be a church that is fully awake in the presence of God and senses his presence and is healthy and increasingly becoming more like Smyrna and like Philadelphia, who are found to be faithful. So let's look at this last church in Revelation chapter 3. This is the church of Laodicea, the last one on the circuit. We'll read just the first verse and just kind of see the context. It's Revelation 3, 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. There is a lot in that one verse, and so we'll take a few minutes and we'll hang out just in verse 14. Let me give you the primary truth. This is the overriding truth from this verse and the whole letter, is that the infinite perfections of Jesus includes his dependability. Let me say that again, okay? The infinite perfections or the glory. So the infinite perfections of Jesus includes his dependability. So he is revealing his glory by being dependable, by being trustworthy. And you see it in verse 14 where he says, the words of the amen. So Jesus says that he is the Amen. Now, the word amen is actually a Hebrew word that was translated straight into Greek. It was actually not even translated, really. It was just taken, the same word amen, into Greek. And it has made it into pretty much all modern-day languages. So if you, if you ever listen to someone praying in a whole different language, you can make out one word every single time. Amen. It doesn't matter if it's Mandarin, Spanish, German, Russian, pick a language. When they end it, they'll say, amen. You're like, oh, I know that word. Yes. Yes, you do. Because that word is a Hebrew word that has been carried over into basically every modern day language, including into Greek. It was carried over into it. And so when you see amen, understand that is actually a Hebrew word, but it's become a global word. And we all say it, but what does it actually mean? What does amen mean? And why does Jesus say he is the, not a, the amen? Well, the word amen is an affirmation. So it's a heartfelt, deep, I agree. That's what it means. It means I affirm what was just said is true. So I agree with what was just spoken or revealed. Yes, I'm with you. My heart agrees with that. And so quite simply, it means yes. It means yes when we're referencing to God. And the word amen is used throughout the Old Testament. I'll give a lot of examples, but I'll, I could, but I'll just keep it to one good example of how it's used. In the Psalms use it often but Nehemiah chapter 8, you don't have to look it up, but later if you want to. Nehemiah chapter 8 is an awesome text where God's people are being restored after exile. And, and the teacher of the law, the scribe, um, my mind is escaping me at the moment, Ezra. I'm like, what was it? Ezra. Ezra and Nehemiah were friends. So Nehemiah built the wall, and his friend Ezra was a teacher of the law. And so Ezra has this big platform that's built, this wooden platform. And then he was on it, and everyone else was below him. So quick sidebar. For all of those people today that want to poo-poo the preaching of the word, those that want to say, oh, proclamation is so yesteryear, or proclamation is just this, this uh, American or this Western concept, and we need to evolve past preaching, and, and we need to be more creative and do like more videos or engage people or whatever. Well, first of all, the idea of the, a teacher of the law who was standing up on the platform and the people of God are listening is not a Western concept. It is not American. It's Hebrew. 
Ezra was on a platform preaching the word, and the people of God, now, they were standing. They, they weren't sitting. But nonetheless, the idea that he was on a platform proclaiming the word, and, and this is amazing in Nehemiah chapter 8, but it says towards the end, like in verse 5 and 6, it says, the people answered, amen, amen. So the people of God cried out, amen. Which, by the way, that's also not a new concept. And that's not an African-American church concept. Like, I'm not trying to be funny. Like, I'm serious. It's not. It's a Bible concept. It is an ancient Hebrew concept. The people of God verbally crying out, amen, amen, to the preaching of the word. And it says, and they lifted up their hands. Again, that's, that's not charismatic. That's Bible. They cried out, amen, amen. And then they lifted up their hands, and then they fell and bowed down and worshiped. This is the response of the people of God when they're hearing the word of God proclaimed when Ezra was preaching. They cry out, yes, yes, amen. We agree with what you're saying about the glory of God. We agree that we need to change and that we need to submit ourselves and surrender to the word. Yes, amen, we agree. The Bible is reliable. The Bible is trustworthy. So we're not going to rely on our own ideas or our own philosophy. We're going to rely upon the word of God. Which is why in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, so 2 Corinthians 1, 20, it says, For all the promises of God find their yes, their amen. The promises of God find their yes in Jesus that is why we through him, Jesus, so through Jesus, we utter our amen to God for his glory. Amen. I love it. All of God's promises are yes in Jesus. And then we can declare amen because of Jesus. So Jesus is God the Father's amen to all the promises that he has spoken. So everything in the Bible that points to is fulfilled in the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus affirms all of it. And he doesn't just affirm it, he assures it. This is key. Jesus doesn't simply affirm what the Bible says is true about him. He affirms, but he assures it. He guarantees it. He solidifies. He grabs it and gives it to us. And how did he guarantee it? With his substitutionary death on the cross. It is all about the gospel. It's about his substitutionary death sacrificial, atoning death on the cross that takes our sin and our shame upon his holy, sinless body, and he paid it all. And so he guarantees all the promises of God. And so Jesus is literally God's amen to us. So because if you are in Christ, if you were with all of your heart trusting in the work of Jesus on the cross, you're trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation. By God's grace alone, through your faith alone, for his glory alone. If you are trusting in Jesus, then you are in Christ. He is in you and you are in Christ. And so Jesus is God's amen. And so here's what this means. God looks at you and he says yes to you. Yes, God is for you. Yes, God loves you. Yes, your sins are forgiven. Yes, your shame is taken as far as the east is from the west. Yes, God has a purpose and a plan for you. Yes, your life matters. Yes, God says yes to you. Yes, he will never give up on you. 
he is declaring and he's crying out to you, yes, and I know, I get it. You look in the mirror and you see failure. I know you look in the mirror and you see disappointment. And you see the struggle or the pain. And you say no to yourself. But when God looks at you because of Jesus, he says amen to you. He says yes. This changes everything. Yes, God loves you and has a purpose for you because of Jesus' once for all death on the cross. So, Brother, sister, or if you're not yet a brother or sister, but you're a friend. Yes, you can trust in Jesus. Yes, you can. And you're made for this purpose. It says in verse 14 that he is the amen of God, and he is the faithful and true witness. That's what amen means. Faithful and true witness. He is the faithful one and he is the true one. He is trustworthy. He is dependable. So let me tell you this, taking notes. God is dependable because he is self-dependent. This is important. God is dependable because he is self-dependent. He is independent. He is self-sufficient. Because of his self-sufficiency and his autonomy, because he is self-dependent on only himself, he is leaning on nothing. He's relying on no one. Because he is self-sufficient and self-dependent, that means you and I can depend on Him, so he's dependable, trustworthy, precisely because he is self-sufficient. So talking about here the doctrine of the self-sufficiency of God. Now, that is long conversation, and I'm going to give you a very shortened version because there's books on this, on God's self-sufficiency. But I will say this in brief, it Embracing God's self-sufficiency is embracing a kind of a hard reality. And you know what that reality is? God does not need you or me. He doesn't need us. Let's just make this very clear so we're all on the same page. God needs nothing from me or you. He is completely self-sufficient, lacking in nothing, no deficiency. God did not create the world or the people that are in it because he was desperately lonely or something like that. Like, no, God was just fine without you or me. He was enjoying eternal glory between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in harmony, displaying glory, esteeming each other, enjoying each other. God was just fine without you or me, but he chose to create for the purpose of displaying that glory that already existed within the Trinity. He is self-existent and he is self-sufficient. So the living God lacks nothing. He is not improved by our existence, and his existence is not diminished by our failures. Do you understand this? This is, this is huge. He is not improved or he does not worsen because of us. So God is not dependent on his creation. So that's the bottom line here. God is not dependent on what he has created. He is independent from his creation. He is self-sufficient. And on this topic, this is important for us to understand, 
God is the one and only self-sufficient being in existence. Nothing else in the universe, nothing else that exists is self-sufficient. Only God is self-sufficient because he created everything that exists from the power of his own word. So he sustains the entire universe by the power of his word. He is sustaining the stars and the planets and the supernovas and he, all the entire universe. He is sustaining every single molecule in existence by the power of his word. So everything is contingent upon, is de- depending upon, sustained by God. He sustains everything. He is self-sufficient and everything else is designed to be dependent upon God. And so his self-sufficiency becomes the foundation for why we can trust in him. Just stop for a second and just think about it. Like, you just think, what are the things that you, don't say it out loud, what are the things that you turn to for hope and for happiness in this world? Whether it's your career or a hobby or your income or that vacation or having a family or your children or your spouse or a nicer toy, you name it. A new iPhone, Christmas is coming up in a few weeks. What is it that you're looking forward to? What is it? that you most are looking to for a sense of happiness or hope or joy. And if you've lived a little bit longer and like me already have some gray, then you've already learned this. I hope, God knows, I hope you've learned this. All of those things will fail you. I mean, it happens every single September. Everyone Every football team is O and O. Every football team is so excited. New season. Everyone is so pumped after the preseason, except for with COVID. And, and everyone's excited about their team. But by this time of year, when your team is like two and nine, you're like, oh, oh yeah, that's right. My team stinks, and there's no joy there. It's not there. You can look for it and hope every single Sunday they keep losing. It's, it's not there to be found. And the reason why sports and career and money and people will let you down is because they're all self-sufficient. You can't rely on them. You can't lean on them. You want to lean, you fall over because, you, you can't, because they can't hold you up. They're not strong enough. They're not designed to hold you up. They can't. You lean on things of this world and they topple over. And then you want to leave another one, and it's falling, and all of a sudden you're falling on your face. And you're like, why do I keep falling? Why is my soul so depressed? Why is life not turning out? And the answer is pretty simple. Um, you're depending on things that are not dependable for ultimate joy and purpose and hope. We are not self-sufficient, and nothing else or anyone else is only the unchanging and unchangeable character of God. God can't be moved. God can't be shaken. He is a firm foundation. And so you, if you lean on God, guess what? He's not going to fall over. He's not going to let you down. He won't lose. He won't fail you. He won't betray you. He won't abandon you. He will never hurt you. He's reliable because his character is good and unchanging. And therefore, you can lean on him. You can depend on him. You can trust him. Even when it's hard or uncertain, or painful, or terrifying. Where are you looking to? What what are you depending on? See, God is dependable because he is self 
dependent. And verse 14 describes how our very purpose, which is to glorify God, is connected to our depending on him, our trusting in him. It says Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. Yes, we're still in verse 14. He is the beginning of God's creation. So Jesus was present at creation. He was there. Look in Colossians 1. Also, high Christology describes Jesus in creation. So it says that he is the beginning of God's creation. He was there when creation began. But it's more than that. This is also describing that Jesus is the beginning of God's new creation, God's recreation, because that is the thrust of Revelation. The whole book is that, Behold, he who stands on the throne says, I make all things new. So he is recreating. So he's the beginning of God's new creation. So here's the thing. You can't change your heart. You can't change your desires. You can't make yourself love God. You can't make yourself care about the things of God. You can't make yourself hate your sin. You can't. You can try with your own willpower and you will fail. What you need is a new creation. You need to be regenerated, made new, born again from the Spirit, and then you receive a new heart, and then you can respond back to God with faith, with trust, with obedience, but he takes the initiative. It is God who is at work. His Spirit is blowing and making people new, and we receive it, and we respond. So we can depend on him and we must. We're created for this. So the infinite perfections of Jesus include his dependability. Among all his infinite glorious perfections, being dependable, trustworthy is one of those characteristics that you see in this text. Now, this truth, Jesus being the Amen, the faithful one, the true one, the beginning of God's new creation is telling us that he is fully dependable. And this is a Jesus that we worship and may he burn in us. This truth has huge implications for how we live our lives and what our church looks like. And we give you three truths about how this matters from this text about dependence. Truth number one, let's see the hazard of self Dependence from a church in Laodicea, number one, the hazard, so the dangers, the hazard of self-dependence. So it's dangerous to depend upon yourself, verses 15 through 17. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you be either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, blind, and naked. And that's just horrible. He says that you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. There's real hazard, real danger in self-dependence. Now, we saw in the map earlier how there were seven cities. The other six were all located on, on mountains because there's mountains in, in Turkey. Um, but this one, Laodicea, is not on a mountain. It's the exception. It is on a valley between two other mountains, two major cities. One is Heropolis, and the other one is Colossae. So it's in the, in the valley between these two cities. Not too far away, but several miles away. So the, the city of Heropolis was well known for on the face of their cliff, on their mountainside, that there were, there were hot springs that would flow. And these hot springs were considered medicinal, so for healing. If, if, ever gone to hot springs in Arkansas? 
then you'll see that even less than 100 years ago, like I'm talking 1900s, people would go to hot springs to find healing. Like it was this idea that if you would go and, and bathe in and drink these hot waters that fill with minerals, that it would heal you. So historically, up until like even just a few generations ago, his, historically, people have always believed that hot springs with these minerals are for healing. And so same thing 2,000 years ago. The people of Heropolis were known as a, like a healing center. People would travel to Heropolis and go enjoy the hot springs because it was a source of healing. And then the other city, Colossae, also had springs, but theirs were cold and refreshing and very useful. So the hot springs of Heropolis and the cold, refreshing springs of Colossae were both very useful. But when you lived in Laodicea, um, you didn't really have mountain. You didn't have a water source. There was no lake. There was no river. And so to their credit, they basically created an aqueduct with stone pipes and they would bring in water from Colossae and from Heropolis. And so they'd bring in these waters in these stone pipes, but it was full of sediment. So by the time the water actually got to Laodicea, it wasn't hot anymore, and it wasn't cold either. It was warm and gross. It was disgusting, and it had a foul odor, and traveling down these stone pipes, so Laodicea was known for having water that's horrible. Now, I experienced this when I went to Odessa. <laughs> so I had been living in Louisville at the time for seminary, and I loved it. There was refreshing water in Louisville, Kentucky, and then we go to Odessa, and I was interviewing for a position there, and I was in the hotel, and then I was brushing my teeth, and it was like, Bleh! I was like, we can't move here, like, we can't, we can't live in West Texas because the water is horrible. Like, it smells bad. And I, you kind of get used to it after seven years there. But no, 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 I never got used to it. Um, the best part of Odessa was that my daughter was born there. Um, Abby, 14 years ago today, she was born there. Um, and so that's, that, that's the biggest blessing of Odessa because the water was horrible. I get it. I understand Laodicea. Like, I've lived in a place that has revolting, like, vomitous water. And so when Jesus is talking to them, and he says, you're not hot or cold, what he's saying is, you are not useful. The hot water is useful for healing. The cold water is useful for drinking. You stink. You taste disgusting to me. You make me want to throw up. He says, it, when I look at you, it turns my stomach. I get nauseous. Like, this is a language. Like, understand what Jesus is telling this church in Laodicea. You make me want to throw up. The question is, why? Like, why was Jesus so frustrated with them and so disappointed? And he calls them to repent, and he says that it makes his stomach turn to look at them. Why? Self-dependence. Self-sufficiency. Their attitude of thinking that they don't need God. Now, besides having terrible water, Laodicea was well known for banking. So it was like the Wall Street of Asia Minor. All of the investments, all the banking, the hub was Laodicea, which inevitably made them wealthy, made them rich. And so they're relying upon their investments and their banking and were very wealthy. Also, they were known for producing a balm, a salve for, for eye ailments. And so people that had eye problems would go to Laodicea and buy medicine to have their eyes heal. Also, they had this very expensive, very rare sheep that had this black wool, and they produced beautiful, luxurious, fine black 
wool that was sold all around, exported. And so they were, they're making some serious bank between their eye medicine, their black wool, and between their banking. This was, this was a financial hub. Yes, despite their bad water, there were some advantages to living in Laodicea, such as their commerce. But they forgot their need for God. They forgot. They were so wealthy and affluent, they actually forgot their dependence on God. And so verse 17, if you say that I am rich, I have prospered, I need nothing. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like America. I'm rich, I've prospered, I need nothing. But what does he say? Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked. He calls them out for every one of their well-known industries. Oh, so you're well-known for your wool? You're actually naked. You're well-known for your wealth? You're poor. You're well-known for having this eye medicine, you're actually blind. He's calling them out. All the things that have made them so wealthy and famous and affluent and comfortable, man, they're living with toxic comfort. And Jesus calls them out. He says, I hate self-dependence. Man, this city was amazing. So in like A.D. 60, so I think 30 years before the letter was written, there was a major earthquake, and it devastated Laodicea. It also devastated other cities too, um, like Colossae that never came back from it. Um, but, but Laodicea actually rejected money from Rome because Rome wanted to rebuild Laodicea because of their industry, and they said, no thank you, no handouts, no stimulus, please. We got this. And they rebuilt the city on their own. And, and archaeologists have uncovered um, just gold coins and so forth, just coinage from this era. And on their coins, you know what they minted? We did it ourselves. That was on their coins. We did it ourselves. Man, this was a proud city. It almost sounds like a rugged individualism that we can hear about in other countries today. And we did it ourselves. We got this. We don't need God because we did it ourselves. And so this attitude of independence from God and self-dependence makes Jesus want to throw up. This talk to comfort. And I think sometimes the church, in general, speaking general here, is just way too comfortable. And so we see the hazard of self-dependence. Number two, second truth, we see healing from self-dependence. So there's the hazards, the, the dangers of it, but then there's the healing from self-dependence, verses 18 through 19. I counsel you. So I'm, I'm telling you, here's what you do, your counsel. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Again, he uses everything that they're known for. And he, so he tells them, oh, you think you're wealthy? You're actually spiritually bankrupt. You're poor. Buy from me gold refined by fire that you can be rich. But real wealth, spiritual wealth in Jesus' wealth, wealth of his presence. And then he tells them, oh, so you're well known for these black wool garments? Buy from me white garments, showing that you're pure and holy and set apart from this world. 
He's like, oh, y'all sell this eye salve, buy from me true eye salve that will heal your spiritual blindness so that you will see my glory and see more joy in me than all of your possessions and your investments and all of your comfort. He tells them, repent, and then he says that he disciplines those that he loves. That's heavy because because it says that he disciplines who he loves. As parents, I've, I've heard parents sometimes say to, to, to the children, well, I love you, but I have to discipline you. That's not true. That's not correct. Don't say that to your kids. Don't tell them, I love you, but I have to discipline you. No, I love you. That's why I discipline you. I love you. That's the reason why you're grounded. I love you. You've just lost your phone. I don't hate you. I love you. I love you, so I, I need to discipline you. Because it's an act of mercy. Because the path that you're on is leading to destruction, away from God, away from joy, away from purpose, away from Jesus. And so he, he will do whatever it takes to get your attention, to bring you back, because he loves you. So his discipline, whatever he's going to do or allow to happen in your life to get your attention, to bring you back, even if it's painful, he'll do it because he loves you. So what are you depending on? What do you turn to to get through your day or to get through your week? What are you most hoping is in your future that you think, if I never get this, if this, whatever this is, if this never happens, then I just can't picture life really being worth living. What if you never get it? What if God says, no, son, no, daughter, I don't want you to have that. Because if you have that, you'll forget about me. And so I'm taking it away. I don't know what it is. I'm not sovereign. But he will take away, he will strip you of whatever he needs to strip you so that you will look to him, depend on him, and find joy in him. And he wants to heal you, heal your blindness so you can see him and enjoy him and have real joy, not fleeting, passing, earthly joys, but real joy in his presence. There is a healing from self-dependence. It's repentance, turning away from that sin and trusting in Jesus. And he will do whatever it takes to get your attention because there are real hazards to self-dependence, but there is healing in Christ who will repent and turn to him. Lastly, there is a happiness of Jesus' dependence. Real happiness in Jesus' dependence, depending on him as we finish up this letter and the series. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down on my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And this is such powerful and even well-known verse, verse 20. You know, the essence of the gospel is not be religious. So some of you in here, maybe you're checking this thing out, this faith thing, and you're not sure where you're at spiritually. Well, let me just tell you something. It's not about be religious. It is not about clean yourself up and then come to God. It is not about change yourself and be a good person and then God will accept you. It's not make yourself good enough so that God can then approve of you. It's not any of that. It's not. It's verse 20. I'm at the door and I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. The good news, the gospel is hearing the voice of Jesus 
and seeing his glory and recognizing your desperate need for him and then letting him in. And then this picture of eating together, oh man, that's a picture of enjoyment, isn't it? Thanksgiving, isn't that a joyful thing of sitting and enjoying each other and eating together? He says, I will come in. I will live there with you. I will eat with you and you with me. We will be together. The gospel is receiving the goodness of God, receiving forgiveness. And this good news is that Jesus paid it all on the cross, and so we can trust in him and be made new. He promises victory in these verses. He who has conquered, because Jesus has conquered, he gives us victory. And I love this for Renewal Church. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Hear what the Spirit says to this church. You know, I was... I was watching a philosophical film recently, and I love, I love a quote from the great philosopher Olaf from Frozen. Um, it's, it's just this powerful truth. In the sequel, the magical snowman says, did you know that an enchanted forest is a place of transformation? I have no idea what that means but I can't wait to see what it's going to do to each one of us. Man, there's so much truth in that. Not an enchanted force, but life of following Jesus is this journey, this path of transformation. And I'm excited to see what he's going to do with each one of us. I'm excited to see what's going to happen because the path of following Jesus is not the path of staying the same. It's the path of transformation. And he's at work. If we will depend on him, what you will find is Jesus. And he's at work in this faith family. So I'm excited to see what he's doing because he is faithful. So we can place our complete faith and trust in him and encourage each other and be a church that truly does radiate the glory of God.